Okay, then why don't we start? Um, thank you very much. My name is Chris Waddell. I'm from uh, Carleton University. Unlike the program, which tells you that Gavin is going to be the uh, moderator, I am the moderator. <laughs> so, and, and what we're, do what we're doing for this is something a little bit different. And we're going to try and each of our presenters will uh, will speak for about five or seven minutes. Then maybe I may ask them a few questions, or we'll get the audience involved and have shorter pre short presentations, and then a little bit of a discussion and see how much of a discussion we can generate. But what I wanted to do um, to take up my five to seven minutes is tell you a little bit about who all the panelists are, because the program is very good on, on telling us what's, going, what's happening in all the sessions and what, the people, what each of our panelists are talking about, but not so much as to who they are. So I've got a few biographical notes I'll go through quickly, and we're going to do our presentations in the order in which we appear here, starting with, uh, with um, um, with Gavin, who uh, joined Ryerson in 2012 after several years as a sessional and part-time instructor. He oversees a digital platform of the Mass Tech course at the Ryersonian for fourth year undergraduate students and second year uh, graduate students. He also leads the compulsory second year digital journalism course. Uh, he was at Transcontinental Media previously where he was a, a senior writer for uh, investment executive and, uh, and did a lot of work in their social media as uh, area as well. Beside Gavin, also from Ryerson, is Lisa Taylor. She's, a, um, she's an assistant professor. Uh, she spent a decade with CBC Radio and Television in a wide range of, uh, of journalistic roles. Um, graduate of a uh, law school at Dalhousie, has taught at, um, at um, went back uh, and did a Master of Laws from the Schulich School. Um, <laughs> and I can uh, do that. Yeah, yeah, that was very good. Uh, she's lectured at King's and Mount St. Vincent. Um, she, in 2015, she received Ryerson's Faculty of Communication and Design Dean's Teaching Award and was co-recipient of a grant from the Ministry of Training Colleges and Universities to develop a series of open source online learning modules. Beside, um, beside Lisa is Romaine smith Fullerton. Uh, she's been teaching uh, at, since its inception in the Faculty of Information Media Studies. Correct. At Western University. University of Western Ontario. My son goes there too. Yeah, University of Western Ontario. <laughs> My daughter Ontario. did too. University of Western Ontario, yes. That's a contentious issue. Um, she's, uh, and also taught in the, in the graduate program in uh, journalism and media studies. She uh, teaches a uh, media representation of women course at the moment, another course on information in the public sphere. And in journalism, she teaches journalism communication theory as well as a, a, a summer offering called Introduction to Print. Um, and finally, Bailey Garretts from Queen's University is a PhD student. Uh, she's a pursuing a PhD in political studies at Queen's, where she's investigating recent news coverage of domestic violence in Canada and examining how news is produced in four Ontario cities. News about that issue is produced in four Ontario cities, Thunder Bay, Kingston, Ottawa, and Toronto. So with that, why don't we start with Kevin? Okay. So I'm going to start with a, a story that seems unrelated. My uh, my spouse was at a conference uh, where one of the main speakers in a nice suit, ran off the stage to go vomit for five minutes, came back, and finished. Um, the, uh, finished I'm not vomiting. No, finished the presentation. <laughs> I'm telling you this because I'm actually kind of feeling under the weather, so it gives you a little dramatic tension. <laughs> and, uh, but also there's something to learn from this. He did two presentations that weekend, and he got great audience feedback on the one where he left to bar and come back. So he, he thinks he got sympathy vote. So you can take that to your lectures if you want. And, um, probably wear thin if you did it every time though, I guess. So the, uh, the one thing that does not wear thin for the audience is uh, crime news. Um, there's so much great research literature about, about crime coverage. Um, I'll just touch on some of it here. I think this is stabbing news, uh, which came, this is a, a journal article from 2015, kind of covers all the bases, go, goes into a historical kind of context of all the sociological work that's been done on, on news and crime. So I just sort of a tip of the, tip of the hat to the many, many, many great researchers in, the, in this area, um, and especially this article, because it informed me. Um, this is kind of the, the top line of what we know already. Crime and TV news is, is something we know a lot about. Um, there were studies done in 1998 and 1999 that showed at least 28%. I'm, I'm kind of pulling together a bunch of studies, so at least 28% of the stories on nightly newscasts were uh, about crime. 
And then there's another particular study done about 10 years later that showed that violence of any sort was uh, made up 40% of local newscasts in, in broadcast news. Sorry, is that Canada? Uh, sorry, these are US, yeah, these are US. Although I'd, I'd be surprised if it was much different here. Um, so you know, the, 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 so why does this happen? Well, there's, there's kind of critiques that say, well, this is to sell the news. Um, we know in newsrooms that it's actually easy to cover crime stories. I mean, the, the police find the news and you, and you sit at the cop desk. I, I did that for two years uh, at the Ottawa Sun. I was a general assignment reporter, paid, did my time at the cop desk, you know, listening to the scanners. And actually still when I go back to Ottawa, I think of, when I drive in from Carlton Place, I think I was there for a drowning, I was there for a whatever, a murder, <laughs> I was there. It's like kind of, actually it's an anxiety inducing thing to drive into Ottawa for me, um, for that reason. Um, so, I mean, the, and there's critical literature about this, you know, that the, the, this kind of coverage in newspapers drastically oversimplifies the nature and the context of crime. Um, there's been studies that, that show that this kind of coverage in the news supports tough on crime policy um, with regards to the audience. So the audience sees this and is more inclined to support um, tough on crime measures. Um, and, and studies around stereotyping and bias and prejudice show that there's, a, there's an overlap between uh, racialized stereotyping and, and, and criminal coverage for various reasons. So there's lots of reasons that, that maybe newsrooms don't want to do this, but we, we still do. Um, and and we, we know, frankly, that newsrooms are in the business of covering the news. So, and this is news, there's no denying it. You know, the, all the sociological news work shows that um, what makes news is what doesn't happen normally every day. So um, that's why we cover it, statistically speaking. Um, so if we know all this, then why the heck am I revisiting it, you might ask. Well, we also know now that, that uh, the audience may play a part in news selection because of what we, what we understand about how newsroom reporters and editors sometimes watch analytics. And they think, well, if that type of story works and the audience is, is watching crime stories, well, maybe, maybe I will Maybe I'll tell more of them, or maybe I won't if, if they're not sharing these stories as much. So this is a, a relatively new part of the, of the discussion, is this concept of network gatekeeping. In other words, if the audience can somehow affect the news coverage uh, that's happening in the newsroom because of, because of what's happening with regards to analytics and how important we know that is. Um, there's lots of research around that that sort of informs where I'm coming from. And then there's, there's the concerns of what the audience might get out of it. There's uses and gratifications theory. And there's, so, so the, this is how it breaks down. People read stories online mostly to relieve boredom. And they, they also do it as a sort of surveillance technique. They want to see what's going on. They, they want to know what's going on with the news. But when people share content, they're doing it sometimes for different reasons than the reading. And they share often because they want to show who they are to the world and what's important to them. And they want to know. And they actually, and there's an element of this that is sometimes altruistic. They actually want to share something educational. So that also informs uh, why I did this study and why, why I would revisit this again. Because we all know that um, if it leads, it, or sorry, if it bleeds, it leads. So here's what I did. I took two data sets uh, from January 26th. Um, I took a randomized data set of just articles that we pulled out of ProQuest um, using a, a number randomizer, just basically pulled the, any old articles. And then we used crime articles. So, and, and the way I found crime articles with a, a ProQuest Boolean search using a study from Taggart. He, he, he categorized the, the most common words um, from news articles about violence, and here they are, there's like 20 of them. So we, so we jammed all those into the ProQuest Boolean search, and presto, we got about, I don't know, like 120 articles. Um, and then what we did, because those were newspaper headlines, we, Lisa, well, we, we, <laughs> Sorry. we located the, the URLs online, and then I was able to, with the help of 
three mystery newsrooms, which I can't reveal. It was part of my non-disclosure agreement. I, I went into their Omniture data, and I could pull down all of the reading data, all of the sharing data, and the referrals. So, and, and the distinction is there, if someone clicked on a Facebook article and that went back to the newsroom, that's a referral as opposed to a, a share. And then I also looked at time on the page. Um, and then I did a correlation analysis with the help of my friends in the Ted Rogers School of Management. And then, and so this is the results. Um, these are the crime articles. You can see, if you look at, can you see my arrow there? So if you look at um, the mean number of, of page views, you see around 10,000. Um, Facebook shares around 500, Twitter shares around, around 60 Twitter shares, um, and then referrals and, and Twitter referrals and time on page. That's for the crime articles. Uh, for the random articles, much lower mean, around 6,500 page views. Still a lot of Facebook shares and Twitter shares. Uh, maybe a few lower referrals and, and, uh, from both uh, Facebook and Twitter. And time on page doesn't appear to be much different. But here's, here's, the, so here's the statistical results. There was no correlation at all between the crime articles and time on page, um, oh, sorry, between anything except for crime articles and, and just clicks. So the number of times that something was read. That was the only statistical relevance. And um, so when you look at the time on page, there was no difference. No difference compared to the random articles. Um, there was no difference in Facebook shares or Twitter shares or the referrals back to the newsroom from, from the sharing. Um, so this is, I found a little bit surprising. Um, and I'll, I'll just talk about why because, um, well I guess first of all, I guess I should say that net, two minutes, two minutes network yes. gatekeeping suggests so, so these results suggest that newsrooms should just keep doing on the same. Keep, keep covering, if you're interested in page clicks and page views, just stick to your knitting as you always have. Cover crime because you're getting, you're getting more views out of it. Um, but weirdly, okay, so this is where it gets interesting. I did a study, a similar study, similar, similar methodology where I, where I took a, a, a subset, a corpus, um, that was only about mental health and mental illness. And when I looked at the, the crime, the, the reading and sharing around those, there was actually more sharing and reading related to stories that were about rehabilitation and treatment. And when I looked at the crime themed stories, just in that corpus, there was no difference. So, so you have to be careful in making really big generalizations because a subset of articles about a different topic might actually re re reveal the complete opposite, which was the case in this study. And that, that was published last fall, um, by the way. And I, I don't know, I mean, we can discuss whatever you want, but I found it interesting. There's a couple of really good studies that suggest that, that reading about crime for the audience is, is related to some kind of moral ritual. The, the reason they like it so much is uh, these, these uh, studies suggest that, that the audience is kind of retesting and revisiting its own sense of morality and what, what is right and wrong. So, um, so I'm, I'm more interested in why, like what does the reader get out of this? Like why crime um, and why violence? And um, I, I just think that's a, a good beginning premise there. Um, and that is all I have to say. And I'm going to leave it to Chris. I guess we'll use the next person. I don't know why I'm clapping for myself. But I didn't <laughs> why are you it? clapping for yourself? <laughs> <laughs> How cool. OK. Um, thank you, Gavin, for doing my lit review. Because I do not have to tell you that there's an incredible body of research on crime coverage. We have that as established. So um, with that, I want to talk about a problem that um, this became a research interest of mine. And I want to credit the journalists who told me this should be a research interest of mine. I'd like to say that I kind of stumbled upon this myself, but I didn't. It came from journalists calling me to say, 
hey, do you know what's going on here? You know, somebody died, somebody was killed, and the police won't name the person, and they always used to name the person, and the first time I got that call a few years ago, I said, never happened before. And then I got another call like a few weeks later, and a few weeks later, and I started documenting these cases, and they were showing up with um, incredible frequency. Um, to be clear, I want to tell you first what the problem isn't before we talk about what the problem is. This is not about a publication ban. Okay, while we have some bad calls on publication bans by times um, in this country, certainly we have a regime of non-discretionary publication bans um, upheld and enforced in the courts that is a, you know, it's, it's a logical and lucid body of law. So this is not about names that will ultimately be banned when something gets to trial. This is an entirely discretionary choice made at the policing level of, yes, I know we named the two guys last week who were killed, but the woman who was killed this week, mm, you know, we just don't think it's appropriate to release that name. And that is the threshold right there. We're just, we're just not going to tell you about this one. Um, this also comes up, although I, I'm not so concerned with it, it also comes up in the context of um, deaths by, you know, what police would call accident or misadventure. You know, when someone uh, is killed because they're cycling and they're hit by a car on Lakeshore, do we, do we, do police release the names or not? So let's just leave them aside because we can argue about whether those matters are public or private matters. But the bottom line is, in our criminal justice system, it's clear that murder is a public matter. If, if one of you is bothered by what I'm saying and you choose to kill me or harm me, that's not just my problem. That is a problem with society as a whole. That's the difference between our criminal law system versus our private law or our civil law system. Um, we, we look at crime as a societal ill, not just something that's affected against the person who happens to be um, injured or killed. Now, for years, it was just such a routine matter that police would, of course, when someone was killed, release the name. Barring exceptional circumstances, that was just kind of a matter of course. Um, and not only just release the name when asked, but usually be fairly proactive in it. And we're still seeing that in some jurisdictions. The weirdness comes with the inconsistency. Um, in some cases, we see police you know, issue news releases, uh, share names and photos and other identifying information online. And then in other cases, we see them holding things back. And the other thing that I want to point out is I'm, as I'm arguing about why journalists need consistent access to this information, that's not the same thing as saying that journalists should always then publicize that information. Because there are other broader and, and interesting issues that I think um, you know, you'll hear touched on in this panel about whether or not it matters. Do we name all um, accused people? Uh, do we name all victims? But that's a choice that can be made in the newsroom using editorial judgment. What I'm arguing against here is police taking this, this exercise of editorial discretion away from working journalists. As I mentioned, it's working journalists who uh, have been driving this for me, thankfully, and um, they're pulling up some really interesting information. This is a story, this is information from a story from last year from um, Kim Boland of the Vancouver Sun. And actually, it's worth a quick aside about Kim because did anyone see a story in the past week or so about Kim actually being in court and hearing that, yes, that there was actually um, mobsters talking about taking her out? because they saw her as a problem, because of her dogged reporting on organized crime in Vancouver. When she told me about this problem a year ago, she said that she was getting threats then from organized crime members, because what was happening is organized, these gang members would be talking to police, and they'd say, well, yeah, you know, my colleague got popped. Um, are, you know, is, the name going, is his name going to be public? And the police would say, no, 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 that's not getting out there. But then Kim would find it, of course, because remember, there's no ban, and she would report it. And then she started to hear you know, people saying, well, I'm going to get you, because the police said that was private information. No, it wasn't private information. They just weren't disclosing it. So this is what Kim found last year. So this is IHIT. That's the Integrated Homicide Investigations Team, which is essentially um, the RCMP. So 2015, there you see, 60 homicide victims, 57 named. A year later, and that was just as of May last, I mean last year, the names of all, of all 15 homicide victims at that point had been withheld. The RCMP said, have, have said in some, I've not spoken to them, but in, in news stories that this is um, because of changes to privacy law in Canada. To be clear, 
There is no change to privacy law in Canada. Let's be abundantly clear. There may be changes in interpretation. There may be changes in how a particularly conservative um, in-house counsel chooses to um, do a risk assessment of privacy legislation, but there is no legislative change. It's just plain wrong to suggest that. Um, another one, this was a CBC story Janice Johnson did just a few weeks ago that I found. Yes. Yes, that's a wonderful part. Did everybody catch that? Kim, the, the police knew. Talk about the discretionary choice to withhold certain bits of information. If mobsters are talking about killing me and you're wondering if I want to know or not, please just let me in, okay? It's better to know. Yes, I will lose sleep, but I'd like to know. Uh, her fearlessness is just, uh, I mean, hats off every step of the way. So, Alberta, Janice Johnson just published this story. Um, and we're seeing, again, it's a, it's a province where there's such incredible inconsistency. So Edmonton Police Services withhold roughly half the names of people killed this year. Calgary Police Service don't withhold any. Now the RCMP in Alberta, again, lack of cohesion, even though right now nationally, and clearly in BC, we're seeing that the RCMP are withholding this information, yet they don't seem to have an issue with withholding in Alberta, even though this is supposedly an edict that comes from headquarters in Ottawa. The other thing you need to know, just, again, there, there are no, if, there, if there's logic, if someone can help me find the logic, let me know, because it's just, it's escaping me. The other one is, why don't we release names, and what does it take to release names? So um, here, for example, in Toronto, we have um, the police, uh, Toronto Police start from a presumption of openness barring exceptional circumstances. Peel Police say no only with, um, with the consent of next of kin. Next of kin is enough to take that presumption of withholding the information and share it. RCMP out of Ottawa are a little trickier. They say that the only person who can give consent to release the identity of a deceased individual is the deceased individual, yes. Exactly. So I think the change I'm trying to bring about is an advanced directive, kind of like the one where you sign off on your organs if you happen to die. And this is, if I happen to be killed by another human being, you have the authority to release my name. That is the only workaround. Dead men don't tell tales. Dead men don't give consent. Done. We just can't do anything about that. Um, the other one that's not mentioned here, and it's an oldie but a goodie, it's just worth bringing up. So here in Ontario, we have the SIU, the Special Investigations Unit, that looks at police-involved um, homicides, sexual assaults, and serious injuries. In Alberta, it's ACER, the Alberta Serious Injury Response Team. This is a story from two years ago. This is the ED of um, ACER, the Executive Director of ACER. Um, and I love her quote. When she was asked why ACER wasn't naming names anymore, she said, get ready for this bit of clarity. It's not that we're keeping it secret, it's just that the names aren't released. <laughs> just let that wash over you, okay? <laughs> just let that wash over you. Um, here in Ontario, while it's, while it, it's a bit in flux, so much about it is in flux about, about the SIU, um, the SIU has said that they will release information when there's a valid investigative purpose. And with respect, I wanna say, how does one not know what one doesn't know? How do you know that this is the name you need to release because you don't have all the pieces pulled together versus you think you have a handle on it, but by releasing that name, that's when I go, oh, Romaine Smith Fullerton was the victim. Well, that changes everything. Um, let me tell you what I know about what's been going on with Romaine. Um, you know, this is what police don't have access to. I think I've kind of alluded to this, but there's no single reason given. The reasons are inconsistent. They are inconsistent within a province. They are inconsistent with RCMP in the Lower Mainland versus RCMP in Alberta versus RCMP in, uh, out of headquarters in Ottawa. There is just nothing that pulls these together. There is no case law that informs any of this. And by the way, when these cases, the ones that actually someone is identified and charged, when they go to trial, the victims are being named. So we haven't reached that threshold of there being some valid reason that a court can see that will withhold this information. Um, the last anecdote I want to recount on this, and I just want to put it out there because I think it speaks to Bailey's research, um, is an incredible story done by Bonnie Allen of CBC a few years ago, and that involved a murder-suicide in the, in the community of Unity, Saskatchewan. And it was an important public story because it dealt with the murder-suicide of a couple who were very well known in the community, very involved. I think she was the local uh, public health nurse. And 
her husband apparently had an undiagnosed mental illness, and this was, a, you know, it fit all the kind of hallmarks of that murder-suicide of a man of a certain, you know, a man of a certain age plagued by mental health problems. Um, and the RCMP chose not to release those names at first, and were eventually kind of pushed by the by the children, the adult children of this couple, because they said, and Bailey, I'm, don't fall off your chair, but they said, oh no, this was. A, murder-suicide of a married couple, that's a private matter. It's a private matter. So, um, I'm sorry if I've just kind of ridden on Gavin's coattails in terms of kind of trying to place this within the literature, but for me this is even less, um, my preoccupation is less the scholarly aspect of this, but the advocacy aspect. This is basic information that local journalists need to do their jobs, and they're being thwarted for reasons that I can't see as having any any logic, any merit, and certainly any, any justifiable rationale. Thank you. So the work I'm presenting today is part of a, a larger international comparative study I've been working a lot on with a, an American colleague since 2010. And I'm, sp I'm just presenting a teeny tiny little snapshot of that material today. Basically the larger project is looking at how different developed westernized democracies cover serious crime. And uh, the working thesis is that the journalistic crime routines, which differ tremendously, by the way, from one developed capitalist democracy to the next, that those crime coverage rituals or practices reflect underlying uh, cultural attitudes about crime, deviance, public right to know, uh, presumption of innocence, concepts around justice. and. You know, as we presented these, these papers for, uh, for, for adjudication, I, if I'd known what everybody else was going to talk about, I probably could have talked about something different because the project started about whether um, differing uh, capitalist democracies name or don't name alleged perpetrators. And um, so I, I have lots to contribute to that discussion. And in, in, the, in the light of that, there were a number of instances in Sweden, for example, where they routinely don't name victims, not because it isn't part of the public record, but because the journalists make different ethical decisions around releasing that information to the public. So it's, it's a fascinating area, and I, it's, so, it's so fun to be here. So I scripted this, so I'll try not to go over my time. So when the press speaks with one voice, it can push back against the forces that threaten the culture's way of telling stories about itself. In Canada and elsewhere, we face a number of crises. Yesterday at Josh Stern's talk, a Unifor representative said that in the face of post media's likely imminent demise, there have been some discussions with members of our legislator about creating alternative economic models so that local news could survive. In many parts of the world, journalism's connection with community have weakened, and it's partly because media outlets have been so focused on competing with one another for audience share that their duty to serve the public has actually become eclipsed. And I think that's come up in a number of other talks, certainly came up this morning in the one about economics. When that primary obligation becomes visible and journalists renew their commitment to serve, the trust between citizens and reporters can return, can be rebuilt. While the situation is not perfectly parallel, The situation is not perfectly parallel. I want to relate to you a bit of the experience about reporters in Dublin, Ireland, to suggest that there may be some lessons for Canadian journalists. The Irish situation is worth considering because local or community-based practices were under threat because of a downward movement in the economy, changing communication technologies, increasing media monopolization, and in Ireland's case, influx of foreign slash British media ownership, and in some countries that we visited, and Ireland to some extent, uh, fears around immigration. In the early 2000s, the British tabloids started to invade this tiny country that has a population that's only slightly bigger than the greater Toronto area. So when you think about a country that's the size of the city, it is in fact a community. Everybody that we spoke to, all the journalists we interviewed, all the crime cover coverage reporters know each other, you know, drink together often, complain, share stuff, and complain. The so-called red tops brought with them when they arrived a style of coverage that was quintessentially British in all its tabloid glory. 
and these new papers threatened to steal Dublin readers with an over-the-top style and differing reporting practices that the more restrained Irish press had rarely used up to this point, with the result that Irish papers were driven to compete with the British papers on terms that were not of their own making. Take, for example, the coverage of the 2007 murder of Rachel O'Reilly and the trial of her husband, Joe, shown here in a wedding picture, who was eventually convicted of the crime. The Irish usually do not name someone who is only a suspect in a serious crime, and reporters wait until the case goes to trial to offer details about what's gone on. They don't show people in handcuffs or shackles, or even describe whether the accused arrives at court under police escort. But this O'Reilly case was very different. The day after Rachel's murder, Joe O'Reilly offered journalists tours of the murder scene, which was the home that he shared with his wife. Because O'Reilly said publicly that he was a suspect in his wife's death, the press named him and offered endless stories about him, about the woman of, with whom he was allegedly having an affair, uh, with other family members, about the O'Reilly's children, about Rachel's parents, and so on, as well as outlining in detail what O'Reilly said he thought happened to his wife. The public attitude was so great for this story that when he was found guilty, the Irish daily crime reporter Michael O'Toole wrote almost 5,000 words of coverage. Another uh, uh, Dublin reporter commented to us, the general elections in Ireland wouldn't gather 28 <laughs> pages of coverage. No, indeed. This style of coverage upset legislators, members of law enforcement, and even some members of the Dublin audience who were shocked at the behavior of its press. But it was a watershed in terms of how Irish came to take back the control over telling their own tales and reinstated their Celtic values. Worried that their freedom might be curtailed by privacy legislation and industry concerns over rising costs and increasing numbers of defamation suits, members of the media created a model for press accountability that relies on self-policing. They established the Irish Press Council in, in 2007 and the Office of the Press Ombudsman a year later, and they gave these organizations real teeth. Together, they established its own code of practice for the Press Council, and that contains a definition of the public interest, a declaration of the importance of freedom of the press, but a statement that this freedom has concomitant responsibilities. The, fun, the founding press ombudsman, John Horgan, told us the government and the media industry, speaking as one voice, negotiated over a period of years with the legislature, but eventually everyone leaned heavily on the model of the Swedish press ombudsman, as well as the Press Complaints Commission of England, which is kind of interesting given the amount of criticism that's been heaped on the PCC in the light of the Leveson inquiry. Uh, then, uh, press Ombudsman Horgan said, we have a unique model. If a paper is being sued for defamation and it's a member of the press council, it can argue that its publication of something was fair and reasonable and that they took steps to establish the truth of the matter. If they're using this defense, they can add in that they're members in good standing of the council and have always published our decisions of, and, and complaints against them that have been upheld by me or by the council. And the judge can take that into consideration in making his or her decision. Horgan also said that the best critics and watchdogs of the press are other members of the business. He said, and I'm quoting, some of the dougiest critics of bad journalism in Ireland are members of the National Union of Journalists. They're the harshest critics of their fellows, and that's as it should be. And I think in the wake of British, the British Levison Inquiry, it will happen more often, and that the press in Britain will become a more effective policeman of itself. Well, I don't know. I think that might be debatable. Uh, anyhow, this over-the-top... Reporting style peaked with the trial of Joe O'Reilly, but the sub subsequent establishment of the Press Council and the Office of the Ombudsman demonstrated to the community and to its legislators the Irish journalists' commitment to the presumption of innocence inscribed in that code of practice and captured in a return to those previous reporting rituals that I outlined. This self-restraint suggests an Irish concern for an individual's reputation that allows him or her to continue to be a member of the community rather than one that suggests a kind of an, an, uh, an expelling from the community and a humiliation of coverage, the public shaming that we have pretty, pretty much uh, here in Canada 
maybe more so uh, to the south for in the United States and equally, equally uh, happening in England. So the establishment of the model allowed the Irish press, which had fragmented through British competition, to fight back against these incursions. And this made, in Ireland's solution, re-establish those connections with community by offering people in Dublin and people in Ireland a way to have their complaints heard. And it allowed the press to reflect the Irish community's ways of telling stories rather than those British ones. Thanks very much. So I'm excited to present on this panel, and no, I don't have um, visual aids, which is perhaps anathema to um, media studies, but we'll go with um, some storytelling instead. And so what I'm presenting on is some preliminary thoughts and findings from my dissertation, which, as was mentioned, I explore how English language uh, Canadian newspapers cover issues of intimate partner violence and how those patterns are produced through an in-depth analysis of four, four cities in uh, Ontario. Because this research is ongoing, I would politely ask folks not to be tweeting my name, and because I talk to police, I avoid at all possibles not being on social media, and if anyone wants to talk about engaging with police, I'd be more than happy to share some tips. Um, but it is, a, it is an a challenging environment to work in. So, you know this is being recorded, right? I do, yeah, okay. yeah. Um, so, uh, so one key component that drives the coverage of this type of gendered violence is police media relations. And what I find is that the police as sources not only contribute to the framing of domestic violence, but importantly set the tone as to whether or not the story will be covered in the first place. So I wanna start with a story. Um, and I do wanna say that this story is outside my four cases, but I think it's really illustrative of, of what um, I'm finding in my dissertation research. So it's summer in a small town in Canada. Journalists are not yet on vacation and the newsroom for this local newspaper, though, is a mere shell of its former self. 30 reporters down to nine. Two interns from a local college swell the ranks to 11 and their stories will fill the thin local pages for the next four months. My first day of observing the local newsroom, I was sat next to sat beside one of the interns a woman with no journalism experience or a desire even to enter the world of journalism. It was just a summer job. When the managing editor introduced me to everyone, he pointed to the in two interns and said, they don't matter. Despite only starting the previous week, she had become my guide of sorts, telling me people's names, when they leave, who to watch out for. <laughs> Today, I had scheduled to talk with one of the paper's editors. When I arrived, my intern guide greeted me with a polite hello and we chatted for a few minutes. I went back to observing the newsroom when she asked, are you doing this for school? What's your research again? I answered and she asked, are you looking at the way colleges deal with sexual assault and domestic violence? Upon hearing the question, I could feel myself getting a tad annoyed, preparing myself to respond and justify why I look at the media. She would have not, she would have not been the first person to tell me I was studying the wrong thing about gendered violence. I responded to the question by saying, no, I'm more focused on the media, although the way colleges handle issues could influence the coverage or in and of itself be covered. She sat back at her computer and I continued, but I don't think many of them handle it well. I started to write in my field work, uh, field note journal that the woman intern and I briefly were talking about my research and I actually have this in my journal and mid-sentence I put my pen down when she says, the college and the police aren't handling mine well right now. She went on to tell me how the college and the police are mishandling her case that happened quite recently. Indeed, the detective in charge of her case told her not to follow through on charging the person because charging him would have made it worse for the woman and it's not like it was that bad anyways. The intern was in, afraid for her safety but yet was showing up every day to do her job. In the midst of the conversation, the editor indicated he was ready for the interview, and I politely asked if I could finish my conversation with the intern. The editor quizzically looked at me, nodded, and walked back to his office. The intern and I continued our conversation, and it came to a natural pause, and I say, I need to go chat with the editor. Can we finish this afterwards? She nods and goes back to her computer screen, which I will note, um, she was looking at ways to leave her apartment um, instead of reporting on a story, because that is quite pressing was pressing for her at that time. So throughout my hour and a half interview with the editor, he confirmed how the police set the agenda for the coverage of 
sexual assault and domestic violence, something my content analysis and previous interviews also suggested. I kept on thinking about the intern, how the police have so much power with the media shrinking and how stories like the interns, a woman writing stories for the newspaper that summer, will, like, will likely remain hidden as the police have not taken her seriously. In interviews with reporters at that paper, I heard time and time again how they simply rewrite police press releases to fill the paper, sometimes without even calling to check the details. The police are not going to write a press release about a case they didn't investigate. So for those of you who have followed the, the Globe and Mail's Unfounded series, the story will come as no surprise to you. What I would suggest and what my research suggests is that series is also a comment on what is not being covered at the newspaper level, or the local newspaper level. What is striking in that is that in, in my case studies um, afterwards, I found that police attention to the issue of domestic violence influenced whether or not a local paper covered it. So in, um, so in, in Kingston, for example, the police communications officer specifically and intentionally goes against the grain of police communications traditions to talk about domestic violence because, in his words, and I quote, it's a large part of our job, and by releasing press releases, we could be potentially offering some assistance or education in regards to these incidents, end quote. The local paper follows suit. In, in a week that I uh, was reading the paper, um, just as an example, a domestic story showed up in every single day. One day there was two, and another day the court reporter had printed an additional story. So there was two days where there was two stories about domestic violence in a small local paper. Um, in another town, so Thunder Bay, the police communication officers offer a more standard view that, quote, domestic violence incidents are not reported, and this is to protect the victim, end quote. And the local newspaper follows suit. Even in, I think it was 2014, when a woman murdered her husband after years of abuse, like her husband was abusing her in Thunder Bay, the police and local newspaper did not identify it as an intimate partner homicide, nor discuss the years of abuse. It actually took a lot of effort for the reporters to uncover that this, like what was happening, and when they did um, report on it, they didn't identify it at all as connected to anything related to intimate partner violence. And I could go on at length, about the close relationship between these two local papers and the police and its influence on um, coverage of gendered violence. But I'll leave it there because I think we have a lot of interesting um, intersections and it's interesting that both the previous presentations also were talking about two cases of intimate partner homicide. Um, yeah, so I'll leave it there and sorry to end on a depressing story. <laughs> TV. Um, why don't we get our panelists back up here? I've got a couple of questions for them, then I'm going to throw the floor open and and uh, and hopefully we'll have lots of comments and discussions from other people. Um, but first of all, uh, let me ask a question to to um, th that I think applies to the the our first three pres presenters. Not so much Bailey, but maybe, um, and then we'll come back with a with a broader one for all four. And the one I was wondering about is in various. We're trying. It was me. It wasn't Lisa. Um, in various cases, e each of you is talking about um, how crime is reported, and we all generally make the assumption that people have a great deal of interest in reading, seeing crime stories. Each of you is talking a little bit about changes in crime reporting. Has anyone done any work to see? whether changes in crime reporting actually have an impact on audience interest or lack of interest. And I'm thinking in the context of Romaine's case, the, uh, the one case that was reported in Ireland, did circulation go up? Were more people interested? Those sorts of things. In the case of, in the case of Lisa, um, has anyone looked at seeing whether there's more or less um, attention paid to cases where names are included and not included? I'm talking from the audience now. And, and Gavin, just a more general question of, that you kind of highlighted on yours. So if everyone wants to take a run at that, then I'm going to come back with one other question that will come back down this way, starting with Bailey, and then we'll throw the floor open and see. And if you guys don't have any questions, then I'm going to have to come up with some more. So that will be a good incentive for you to start asking. So, so in all the countries that um, Maggie and I have looked at so far, and there have been nine, um, it's interesting because what 
people's behavior of what they say they want and people's actual behavior are always different. So people always say um, that they would prefer less gory crime and that they would prefer not to hear so much either about victims or about perpetrators. Uh, but in fact, and, and, and at the same time, you know, in places like Holland, where there is a so-called reputable media as well as a, a very small but growing tabloid newspaper market, those reputable media will say they never get complaints from people saying, you didn't tell me enough gory stuff. And they don't routinely name people accused or people who are victims. However, those tabloid statistics are going up and up. And that kind of, of competition, just like in the Irish case, is affecting the reputable press in a particular way. So they are, the crime story coverage is changing even in reputable media across the nine countries that we looked at because readers do different things than they say they do. So the likelihood is, at least what our research is finding, is that, um, that the net and, um, and the profit motive are, are making crime coverage much more similar around the globe and it's devolving to an American or a British tell-all style. So these little anachronistic, anachronistic or unique uh, rituals that say a tiny country like Ireland has or, or, or some of the practices that are reflected in, in the Netherlands are very much disappearing. Lisa? Um, no, I, I don't have anything that speaks directly to that question and that's in part because the police choice to withhold a name in a homicide isn't necessarily reflected in the final story anyhow because the name's not banned. Uh, journalists do what journalists do. They go to the scene of the crime. They ask questions. They also turn to social media. They look for... Um, Read about it on Facebook or a tweet. Exa or exactly. Like right. It's not so hard to find. So journalists are using workarounds for this, this block in information. Not always, but in, in a significant number of the cases. Kevin? I think it's a great question. I, I suggested at the end of my presentation that yeah, newsrooms just they ought to just keep doing the same thing based on on you know the the correlation that I showed. But uh, really, you could you could take the the corpus of crime news and break it down. <coughs> excuse me, more more uh, <coughs> in a more nuanced way, and then you know maybe stories that take uh, kind of. Um, greater sort of thematic look at crime, um, sort of in a in a sociological context. Maybe they get greater reads. I mean, the the entire Unfounded series by Robin Doolittle is maybe a great example of that. Probably great news readership, and yes, it's fundamentally a crime story. So it'd be interesting to compare that sort of in-depth coverage to the you know, basically the rewritten press release, and, and I can imagine a really great study that would, that would do that. So, um, yeah, someone ought to do that. <laughs> okay. That sounds like if you're a journalism school director, you hear that in your office a lot from a lot of people <laughs> yes. on, on almost every subject. Yeah. Um, let me try one other question that I guess has probably got two or three parts, and the challenge in asking a question with two or three parts is, of course, respondents can answer whatever parts they want. Um, but let me try it anyway. And it comes from something that, that Bailey said at the end, uh, talking a little bit about that. What are the ethical standards you think journalism should be applying on dealing with crime issues, on dealing in, in an era of um, increasing attention on victims' rights, and the possibility that journalists' perceptions of what the proper ethical standards are may not be the same perceptions as the public's? And how do we, how do we, how do we, or should we deal with that, or should we even be concerned about that? So why don't we go down, and we'll start with, we'll start with Bailey. Have everyone offer a quick comment, and then if you want to rebut or add something in, we'll talk about it for a few minutes, and then we'll see what we've got from the audience. So Bailey, why don't you start? Sure. Um, yeah. Okay. So let's let's talk about. You know, and, and whether it can be on identifying people or other sorts of issues related to, to in, the domestic in the domestic violence circumstance or, or more broadly. Yeah, so I think what I'm, I'm not going to answer your question directly. Um, yeah, sorry. That's um, okay. <laughs> uh, so something that's coming out of my research that I find quite interesting is that in some ways journalistic standards around naming people is not actually what's, is not what's taking priority. What's taking priority is police decision making around who gets named, what stories get talked about in terms of domestic violence, as well as sexual, sexual assault. And for me, a lot of ways that I think could address these, like a, a solution of sorts that would bring back 
shift um, um, into the full journalistic standards around these issues is that journalists could actually talk to um, like non-police sources and sort of get, so there was some great coverage in Kingston this year um, after the Unfounded series, because we know that a lot of stuff, like a lot of other journalists took on, you know, what's the local angle on their Unfounded um, series. And they actually reached out to the Sexual Assault Center and had people, and talked to people who wanted to come forward and disclose. And some people ended up lifting their publication bans, some people didn't. And I think that's one way to work around um, this sort of, I think, what Lisa was also talking about, where the it's not no longer an issue of journalistic standards; it's actually police standards of naming. And um, I think I, something that has come out also in my research is that a lot of these, a lot of these journalists in the smaller spaces don't feel like they can challenge the police because they feel like they have a very tenuous relationship, and they're they're like filling the pages, so they're not about to push them and release a name that the police have told them not to release. And so that's a really interesting dynamic. Um, but it's different when you start pluralizing who you're talking to and, mm. and maybe setting up different standards as opposed to just defaulting to the professionalized police communications office. Sorry, that was an answer to directly to your question. For me? I have so many pieces of little bits of notes on my paper, I don't even know where to start. I just one comment about publication bans. When Maggie and I interviewed Canadian journalists, uh, we usually start with a crime, uh, an what, what, what's usually a, what Martin Innes calls us, um, a signal crime, a big crime. So the crime story that we started with at that instance, in that particular instance of time, was the coverage of the disappearance of a little Woodstock girl named Tori Stafford and the subsequent trial of Terry Lynn McClintock and Michael Rafferty. And so we were doing grounded research, so we would ask journalists, did you cover this story? How did you find out about this story? Uh, what kinds of things were you thinking about? How did you make decisions around putting this in or putting that in? And what we came to realize when we, were, when we were doing this work, particularly in Canada, was that because we're interested in ethics, not specifically in laws, but laws make the framework inside of which those ethical decisions are made, Canadian reporters repeatedly commented about publication bans. And there was so much frustration amongst working journalists and editors, and frankly, even media lawyers to whom we spoke. And one of the things that we heard a lot was, you know, this is, these laws are barring us from what we perceive to be our ethical duty, which is to give the Canadian citizens as much information as they need to, to make decisions around and keep an eye on our justice system. And um, it, it was interesting to me that, uh, that, you know, with a little case that I talked about in Ireland, that when those mainstream media outlets came together, they were actually able to influence change. And, and uh, you know, I've, I've been giving some thought to whether there might be room for some of Canadians, uh, Canada's legacy media to, to do more than just um, come together to fight in court these kinds of bans. If, if Canadian journalists were willing to actually um, work together, and I heard this from, uh, from, from the same media laureate as well in terms of access to information. So just that aside about publication bans, in terms of um, ethics, I would point out that my research shows that there really isn't a universal ethic, that the crime reporting practices differ from country to country. So Maggie and I have come up with three working models. The first one is what we call the watchdogs. Um, what do the watchdogs watch? Well, they watch uh, institutions like our justice system, like the police. And that those, the countries in that model would be um, the, the British Isles uh, in North America. Um, in terms of the second model, we call them the protectors. Those are generally countries like Sweden, uh, the Netherlands, um, to some extent Germany, uh, the uh, Scandinavian countries, where what they protect is the presumption of innocence and people's families, both those who are the alleged perpetrators and those of the victims. And the third group we call the ambivalence. Those countries are uh, mostly countries in the Mediterranean, Spain, Greece, Italy, Portugal, there are incredible um, systems of clientelism where, and they, they actually operate under a different justice system. They're, they uh, have an inquisitorial justice system rather than an adversarial one. So arrest records are not public. So I, I, had to, I really struggled there to figure out because the journalists are so hampered in being able to do what they want to do. They rely completely on a system of leaks. 
for information, even if it's about their own prime minister, a former prime minister who was arrested, um, nobody knew. One TV station showed up to cover the arrest because somebody leaked that information. So, you know, the ethical policies are so different. Hmm. It's, uh, it's, it's amazing to me and really a reflection of the history and the culture. Lisa. A little afraid to move that. Um, I'm also going to uh, talk around the question just a little, and I just want to hit on three points that I think are kind of worthy of food for thought in this discussion. Um, the first one, and it was Romaine who mentioned it in a panel I did earlier this week. Um, when we talk about um, whether we name people, whether we name victims or whether we don't name victims, I think it's very easy, especially for young journalists in practice, to assume that all families want anonymity at a devastating time in their lives. For those of you who are or have been practitioners, I'm sure you've all encountered at least that one family who said, uh, no, I lost someone important and I want people to know and I need them to know so it doesn't happen again. I need them to know because this person was incredible. There are people who find it cathartic. So while it does appear, I don't know this, but everything I, you know, everything I take in suggests to me that the majority of families are more comfortable with grief in secret, that is not all families. So um, kind of stepping away and withholding, not sharing information or not contacting a family is not always the best practice. And we have to be mindful of the fact that individuals react in their own way to grief. Um, the second thing that I want to point out around, there's such great shifts, such interesting shifts in our norms around naming names. Um, in the past year or so, I've seen a couple of examples, and you may have seen them as well, of stories in which we would normally see people named, and we're not seeing them named anymore. And two of the most remarkable ones for me, one was um, actually a story on university sexual assault done at St. Thomas University, in which um, young women who had been sexually assaulted and who were saying that the, the, the crime was not being properly addressed were given one name pseudonyms in the story yet they were comfortable with being photographed because we're also very, well, no, but we're concerned about the, the Google search that allows me to search April Lindgren and find this years later. Um, they Olivia, can also search faces, too. Well, they can, and we're getting there, but it's still, it doesn't seem as frightening to people. It's not as easy. Um, Olivia Carvel's um, incredible series from a year and a half ago in the Toronto Star, Beaten, Branded, Bought, and Sold, showed a number of women who had been lured into sex trafficking, um, and again, stills and video both, but a choice to not use names. And one woman told her, when my kids are old enough, I don't want them to Google search my name. So yes, you can show me, but don't name me. Um, and the third one that we're seeing, and I think it's, it's a practice that is really worthy of consideration, is we're seeing, um, and it sounds like Romaine has seen this, this in Ireland to a certain extent, but we're seeing an increasing number of news organizations look carefully at the fact that if someone is charged for, uh, especially if it's a more minor crime, even if their name appears on the police news release, is it relevant? Is it relevant if I turn to crime news for matters of community safety? What I need to know is that the person who's been breaking into cars in my neighborhood, or that someone has been charged for all the break in my neighborhood. I don't need to know that name. Journalists, of course, are not doing this out of high-minded ethics uh, necessarily. It's a resource issue. If I name you and say you're charged, I then have to do the time in court to see what happens with that case. So making the choice to describe the crime and decide, describe or um, report on the fact that someone has been charged with a crime but not name that person eliminates all the time that goes into assessing takedown requests and deciding what to do with the digital record. Can I have a hot person? Yeah, sure, sure. Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, interestingly, Kingston's paper publishes a list of every single person in court, like, and their charges. Right, just a docket, essentially. Yeah. Just a docket, um, but they sometimes will uh, hide domestic violence uh, names. Wow. Um, but it's just really mm -hmm. interesting, and they won't. They refuse to take it off, um, regardless if they were charged or not. Like regardless if they were convicted or not. And they've had a lot of you know, angry mothers coming in and being like, my son's still a good boy and was charged with theft or whatever. I, and is their argument, uh, back to your point earlier, about protecting the victims? Or do they even have an argument as to why they do it? No, they, so for the public record, I just think it's really interesting to add to that. They actually mm -hmm. just publish the names of everyone who's in court. Wow. And that, like, oh, even even the domestic violence ones. Sorry, I thought you said not, they didn't for not the not domestic always, violence. Not always the domestic violence ones. That's that's. It. Yeah, and I was just asking, do they give you a reason why they don't always publish the domestic mm -hmm. violence ones? Um, I'm not a coherent one. Um. <laughs> okay, so what's the incoherent one? Coherence is showing up a lot here. <laughs> no, it's just like so. Sometimes it's to protect the victim. Sometimes it's like we didn't get to it that day. Sometimes okay. it's whatever, but I just think it's interesting to that point because they yeah. don't have resources, but yet they publish all of the names. They just have this dedicated report, court reporter who, like, just yeah, she just pumps out this court list every day, oh and she's gosh. there and not overworked by like a murder trial or something, which is yeah. <laughs>
It's Gavin, very odd. on my ethical questions that no one wants to answer. <laughs> I'll answer. I, um, Yay. <laughs> Yeah, I say publish what's legal, um, and and that basically means in in Canada publish any name that's that's nameable. So, and, it, and that's not really a personal feeling. I think uh, I mean I I like to think in another day and time that we'd make a different decision. I really like that the Irish media was vexed about that that uh, that issue. Um, but I think that I mean ultimately. You know, we live in a world of social media, and frankly, anyone who's directly affected by a story in a small community or big community is going to be gossiping about this and potentially publishing it on Twitter or Facebook anyway. And so there's, there's a place that I think journalists ought to uh, embrace, which is, you know, do your job and tell the facts uh, as much as they're available. So, you know, nature abhors a, a vacuum that there's going to be names named somewhere anyway. So uh, I think you can make the argument there's a job to do there as journalists that we, that we publish. And, so, so I'll yeah. push this a little further. So should we throw out the Young Offenders Act? <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, no, no. names are being published on social media and we're able to find out and it's pretty easy to find out who has been murdered or who's been charged or anything else if you actually want to spend 10 minutes to figure it out. Yes, we should. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I mean, it's a great, it's a great point. Um, I, I, I don't know where to go with that, Chris. It's, it, it's, it was a uh, little bit of an yeah. unfair question, but I couldn't Can resist. I, I, I answered yeah, the sure. one question. Yeah, you nailed know. me with that one. You just, you don't. Yeah, well, the person who answered my question gets a follow-up. Go ahead, Remy. <laughs> <laughs> So it just made me think that, um, that, that here in Canada and the United States, we have a very different idea about, about protecting young people. We have this idea that up until the age of 18, you might make some mistakes, but basically you've, you're a good person who deserves a second chance and you took a misstep. Um, and that is an idea that's extended in other places in the world. That's absolutely the idea in Sweden and Holland, that throughout your whole life, you haven't stopped growing and changing and developing at 18. You didn't suddenly hit grown up. I know I sure didn't, boy. I'm just lucky I didn't get caught, right? Um, so <laughs> I, I really think that that reflects uh, um, the deeper values that communities hold around, around things like um, you know, age of majority, what it means to be mature, and different places make different decisions around that. You know, in the United States, um, um, juvenile court actually has to be closed because if American reporters had those names, they'd absolutely tell them. And, and, you know, the American reporters that Maggie and I have interviewed think our publications are laughable and can't believe that Canadian journalists are so meek and mild that they just obey that. And, you know, way back when with the Carlo Homolka and Paul Bernardo stuff, that was the issue that, that the American press didn't have to abide by those rules, and they weren't. Buffalo versus St. Catharines. Absolutely. And Walking over the bridge. Press. Also true in the Picton case in, in, um, Picton. in Vancouver and Seattle, too. Okay, yeah. audience. Yes. It's, it's the written stuff that they, oh, they so manage, it yeah. Apply to TV no. That's they haven't really come up with a, they, they deal with the, all the written press. And it's so a volunteer, TV people. Reporter theoretically can do the, the tour of the. Well, I suppose theoretically they could, they could they do the tour. The, the Irish say that. They don't do their own one reporting of the most, anyway. <laughs> they don't do their own reporting anyway. The, the, one of the Irish court reporters that we spoke to had a really lovely way of putting it. He said, before, before the English tabloids invaded, um, Ireland was more like a nosy neighbor, but not so punitive, not so much naming and public shaming. So there are actual laws, though, that govern um, both TV and uh, print. So, so there are laws around not showing uh, people's faces or not showing people in shackles. You have to pixelate faces or you can't show them in shackles. That's an actual law and that applies to the, to the television reporters the same as it would apply to the, the print people. You know, you could, you, could, you could be charged with contempt of court for, for breaking those laws. So, so what is unclear to me in a case like this uh, with these rules, so what would be covered not very much at all, and that's actually the law in England. So the law in England is, is, is that there's this kind of gray area. Um, before someone is actually charged, you can talk about stuff, but you need to be very careful because, because people presumably have a reputation. Once someone's been charged, in order to protect the jury pool, you can only say what the person has been charged with, where they're being held, name them, 
um, and the court date. That's pretty much it. Then there's a kind of a, a, a cap put on that, by and large, until, until privilege in court when, those, when that material is introduced in court. And it's the same in Ireland. You, you really, you're not supposed to, by law, n do more than name the basic stuff. April. Well, see, the British tabs have such enormous budgets that they don't really care. They break the law routinely. They were breaking the law in England, too, when, you know, the phone hacking stuff, what's kind of interesting to me about that is, you know, there's all this kerfuffle about the ethics of the British press, but those tabloids weren't just acting unethically. They were breaking the law. And there are laws that they could have, and, and in some instances, were prosecuted under. Meanwhile, the local community papers, like the Echo from Liverpool that you know I was just hearing about in the last session, I also went to the to the Echo this this year uh, in March, and the local papers in England were were always abiding by the press council uh, rules and regulations because they feel so closely connected to their communities. They have to go and drink a beer at the pub with people who will know them and say, "Hey, Lisa, you got that story really wrong, and I'm really pissed about that, and you need to fix it." Can I buy you a beer? Can I buy you a beer? And then it's all fine. So, so you wouldn't necessarily read about the name of an ex about the name about say a domestic murder uh, in the local Dublin media, but you would. You, you might read about it. You just pick up the British tabloid. And you wouldn't even have now. You wouldn't even have to pick it up, right? You can go online, and that's the same thing. Even in 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 Sweden and the Netherlands, where the reputable media would not be naming people routinely, but put in a little bit of information in Google and Belgium is writing all about it, or England is writing all about it, or whatever. So it doesn't take any effort to find the name and the details, but those reputable papers believe that it is ethically wrong, and that's not what their readership wants. It's so different. Um, really? Well, serial, this, the, uh, the initial serial podcast was by a, you know, a Boston print, Boston newspaper reporter. She was the person who took that on. And it's interesting to me to see how um, a reporter with those great storytelling skills and fabulous investigative skills and instincts has adapted herself so well to that new technology and created a fantastic audience for crime stuff. Crime, as you pointed out, is always incredibly popular. It's the thing that everybody... Um, loves to read about, watch, and think about it. And although, you know, it, it's, it's a bit titillating, there also is, as you, as you referenced, in terms of some pretty serious literature, that it makes people, it's, John, uh, uh, Jack Katz calls it the daily moral, your daily moral workout. You can yeah. test how you feel about the edges of what you define as deviant or acceptable behavior every single day when you indulge in this great stuff. So I think it's a new way of doing it. Um, do I think that legacy media could do that differently? Absolutely, and I think, I think they need to figure out a way to make, to, to make that transition in some instances because the, because the business model they have is failing. I would push back a smidge on that, but also say like I also like ate up cereal, so like this is, you know, and all of the other ones like looking for its cousins, like they need yeah. to produce another one soon. Um, um, but I think there are some interesting investigative pieces coming out of some of the larger legacy media in Canada, right? Like the Unfounded series and um, like Tanya Talaga's uh, take on what's happening in Thunder, Thunder Bay and like she's working on a book on that. Like there's some really interesting things coming out of that. What I'd be really interested in in the, in the smaller media markets where you don't have a lot of pluralism or you uh, like some antagonism to the larger media markets that are coming inside if the if police are actually going to let them in so i can tell you what one police officer one communications officer said to me so there's a blogger in town that's what he calls them a blogger and he's like we don't tell them things unless they come in and like sit in our office 
but we avoid talking to this person. So I think there's something interesting in like some of the smaller media markets feeling like they don't need to respond to people doing newer media things. And he gave lots of reasons being, you know, he's biased and he doesn't actually, he's not a real journalist and all of that kind of stuff. So I think it's different in Canada in some of the smaller media markets that are really isolated that don't have, like police can be really choosy about who they talk to and so it's harder to make those um, inroads. Although I do think some, as much as we, yeah, um, it's, say it's always, I think it's always been true on some level so the police have favorites in terms of who they talk to. Mm -hmm. In terms of even, even in big city newspapers and big, and big city dailies, they'll give information to some people they won't give to other people. Oh, totally. Basically based on, on what they think will happen with it or... But there's or, a division yeah. right now around yeah. like being media Trust versus like really. yes. media. Right. That's I think right. a different division than like, like you're my favorite reporter. reporter. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes? Yeah, so I have a couple of questions. Uh, when you're talking your, your research, is it on publishing like um, just uh, fatal domestic crimes or, or just like um, assaults? So what, what are you looking at? All, all of it. It's a lot of news stories. I'm just going to put it out there. Some of them are. It depends on like the case. So I looked at, um, like to date, my sample is 734 stories across Canada from 2014 to 2016, and that's actually um, going to be around 2,000 stories. And so it depends on where the story is coming from. If it's just a reprinted press release, if if it's actually an investigative piece, whether it's coming off the wire, all of these things come into play. Because I'm looking not just at police media engagement, but what patterns of news. Um, exist around issues of intimate partner violence, um, but there's some interesting tensions when it comes to when police, I would say suggest in some places they're writing the news these days. And, and what's the reason, you, you, you alluded to this a little bit before, what are the reasons the editors give you for not publishing them? Like, can you give me an idea of what they? So I can give you some quotes. So one person said to me, we did that story in the 90s. That I'm trying to unpack. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> Uh, I'm, so that that's going to be a paper soon because I think there's some journalistic attitudes around like what's new, right? So like this is a story that's we've already uncovered domestic violence. You're like, oh yeah, okay, that's great, it's still happening. Um, so I had that quote. Another, there are you know editors who are like, well, you know, this is a private matter. And I was like, okay, we're moving on. Um, and then others have said, well, the police don't give us in this information, and we have other things we have to do. Um, and then other people would say, like, we don't want to harm police investigations, so we de defer to them. Um, and then others say we do, we do need to cover it. And others say we're doing a great job. And are large of those editors male? I'm just curious. Yeah. Okay. I'd actually like. Okay, go ahead, Kim. I, I just th I want to maybe point out something obvious, but it's really, really risky for news organizations to to kind of go out on a limb and and publish stories that the police don't back up or that the law doesn't back up. So I mean, I mean, there was a really big case. The, was it the Rolling Stone? Is that the case? Yes, the, yeah, yeah, uh, the uh, sexual. Virginia. Was, yes, yeah, Virginia I mean, attack or wherever I mean, it was. The, I almost feel like I don't yeah. need to say anymore, but it's, I mean, you. It was, um, it was, it was Virginia, Virginia Tech? Assault, University of Virginia. Yeah, it was the University of Virginia. Domestic. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It was but murder, but the, was sexual the concept is the same, right? Well, I mean, they're actually treated differently, like exactly differently. Like it's mm -hmm. it's actually in terms of gender violence. I think there's some interesting comparisons, but fundamentally they're treated differently because we imagine sexual assault to be the stranger. It happens off, like majority happens in the context of relationships. News yeah. is not talking about that, so it's treated differently. So you're talking about stranger sexual assaults, what falls into like what police want to do, because they want to catch mm -hmm. the bad guy, and it's not this messy thing, because you can have the stranger rapist in the, you know, in the bushes, and that's a much easier story, and it's much more exciting than like a complicated, messy relationship between two people who she goes back several times, and like that's complicated. It's to that's, totally fair point. But like I just like I think those are like I I get that it's yeah. totally risky and it's an issue of liability. Like reporters tell me time and time again, like we say police says because we don't want to get sued. We say police says because we don't want to get sued. Legitimate, but I think those need to be differentiated because they are like they're just fundamentally treated differently. Even though I would suggest that they're extremely overlapping. Sorry to. Um, yeah. yeah, and I just want, I just want to add to that one though too sure. because that that also though the police saying that stranger danger sexual assault is a re, is something we should be reporting on and talking about versus intimate partner violence particularly when two people are cohabitating is consistent with the way in which police have used uh, gender and fear of sexual assault 
to allow women to make their job easier because it's so much easier to say, you know what, you shouldn't walk home after the clubs close at 3 a.m. because that makes my world a better place as the, the person who's working that night. Um, it's so much harder to say, you shouldn't go home after work on Tuesday and make dinner. And, and that's the big difference here. So that's the whole kind of constraining women's behavior as a method of reducing uh, the, the frequency of a common crime is just so troubling, it, it gives me an ice cream headache without ice cream. No, I just want one. I've got one question, April, too, but do you have one first, or do you want to talk about oh. what we're doing next? I just wanted to say one thing about, the, about, about this, and, and I just wanted to say that, um, you know, in Sweden and, and in the Netherlands, those stories get covered, but when they're not covered with people's names, it's easier to do those big picture stories, mm -hmm. because people, when you name people and you put up photographs, our interest becomes prurient rather than public. And I think your point about you know domestic violence is not a private crime anymore, for God's sake. I hope I didn't think it was in the 1990s. It makes my <laughs> feminist hackles rise unbelievably. But if we pulled some of those personal as aspects out, they would be, in some respects, easier mm -hmm. stories to do. But we need to figure out legacy media. We need to figure out a different format because the format dictates the content. That's it. One last question to everybody, about, which is maybe it's a rhetorical question, probably, but um, we spent a lot of time talking about crime. We spent time talking about crime being something that drives audiences uh, to read, to listen. Uh, maybe people uh, want to read about crime because they're worried about it might be in their neighborhood or whatever it might be. Um, the statistics generally say crime is going down quite dramatically in Canada. We don't report that very much, I don't think. Maybe I'm wrong. Um, any reason? We don't report that, do you think? Or so domestic violence is not going. I'm not. I'm not saying domestic no, violence. No, no, I'm no, talking no, about crime but I, but generally. I'm actually, I know. Yeah. I'm, I'm just putting that caveat because we often say that in terms of crime news, but like there's certain crimes that are not going down, and we. The Which may also be a function of being more reported than it used to be before, right. too. Right. So like th yes. this is always an issue, right? Like, is it police statistics that are going down? Mm -hmm. Does this actually mean there's less crime? I mean, homicides is one of the ones you can actually track across time because you have dead bodies. But at the same time, we see the way in which murdered and missing Indigenous women are covered, as well as like murder sui or suicide. Or but we also, but we also see it in break and enters. We see it in other things. We see it in a whole range of other uh, in a whole range of other areas too. If you look at statistics over the last 15 or 20 years, and I'm not making an attack on domestic violence, but I'm talking about crime generally and crime coverage. But we don't spend a lot of time in media talking about that. I don't think. No, it's not an accurate reflection of the world in which most people live. And there's a lot of hyped up fear. There's no doubt about it. And that has not changed. But I think the piece that, that all of us could do a better, better job in, in filling is educating audiences. You know, people, if I've heard one thing in the last couple of years, it's that audiences, citizens don't get what it is that j serious journalism is about. And journalists are not great at telling people. And educators are not great at telling. We need media literacy courses that start really young. Um, to help combat some of that stuff. We also need different economic models because as long as, as you know, page views are driving content, people are going to put up crime stats because they're going to get the most hits. Crime stories. Crime, story. crime yeah, stories, not yeah. crime stats. stats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also one thing about crime, you know, when you say uh, crime is declining over the past 20 years or so, that's true, but you know, we could make them define, decline even quicker. Pull, pull drug crimes out and say mm -hmm. drug drug and substance abuse isn't a crime. Wow, our crime stats would look so much better. They do that in other places in the world. Decriminalize some things, but not. Enough. That's going to be a different discussion, I think. Okay. <laughs> we should wrap up, right? We're done. Should. We're done, OK. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you, you, do thank you to the panel. Oh, there. Oh.